Man, the weak made strong in the Savior's love. That is a great song, and I feel like that, that connects very well with this morning's uh, message. Just the recognition that I'm, um, I think sometimes we think that we need to be strong. I don't know, maybe you, you don't, I do. We need to be strong, and we engage in, like, you know, trying to love God more, and that I'm stronger as I love God more, but we're actually quite weak. I don't know if you feel like that at times. I do, and I know I am. But I am the weak is the weak is made strong by God, not not by the weak trying to be strong in themselves. And then the weak is made strong by God's love to us, not our love to God. Amen. Uh, which is a beautiful thing. I'm flipping to Acts here, and that's not where we are. So uh, this morning we are in First John. And uh, we were actually there last week and a little bit the week before, and uh, we'll continue to go through that uh, this morning and uh, kind of still talking about God's love. That's where I was going to go uh, last week uh, before the time uh, mysteriously just kind of vanished. Um, and we'll see what happens today. Uh, but before I jump in, just because um, I, I kind of want us to have a, a really good picture of what, um, what John's saying, but also what God is teaching us through his word. Um, Joel, can you put up that, um, <clears throat> put up that uh, kind of that picture? Okay, so I drew this. It's hard to see, actually. Well, it's hard to see there. It's easier to see here. I drew this last week. I'm going to draw it here because I'm not going to use that the whole time. Um, but just kind of to remember what we're talking about, right? So God is three in one. He's the eternal, uh, eternal gathering, eternal assembly. It's a part of who he is, right? Part of his nature. And so this, there's this foundation of which uh, who, who our God is, is unity. And he's drawn towards himself. There's this nature within God that he's drawn towards himself in unity. It's a supernatural thing. It's a God thing. Okay, and then that foundation of unity is chiefly characterized by two things, love and righteousness. I'm just going to quickly do that here. Unity, this is God, right? And love and righteousness. I'm, I'm writing kind of uh, messy so that if I spell it wrong, you can't tell anyway. Uh, and then the church, right? And because we are children of God, we are part of the body of Christ. We'll be talking a lot about that um, in the weeks to come. We are to live in unity um, and love and righteousness. Well, you, can, you, you get what I'm saying. And then um, as we do, the world sees us, Right? And, and we are a reflection of God. They kind of get to understand who God is and stuff, right? Like it, it becomes a part of what they're, they're doing. And then I kind of closed off last week <coughs> quickly saying uh, kind of the bottom two here. And you see God and the church, right? So you see how there's this flow that if, you're, if we're wondering, okay, where's the church come from? It's not a man-made cre creation because, well, we got this thing going on and we're all Christians and we're believers. So let's, let's kind of... You know, maybe we should just like get together, you know, and hang out on Sunday mornings because, I mean, when we look at other religions, they're meeting together. And when we're looking at like, the, they, they, have, they have synagogues. If they have buildings, we want buildings. Let's do that. Let's just do it, like, you know, and then, and then they have leaders and some of us want power. So why don't we, you know, appoint leaders and the people that want power, they can be the, the power people. And, and we can kind of start doing this and kind of setting this up so that it looks kind of like the tabernacle and temple, a little bit of Judaism there, but also a lot like the pagan worship that's going on in our day. I mean, we're not in our day, but I mean, it happens in our day too, but back in their time, you know, the disciples saying like, you know, if you wanted to go worship, uh, you know, the goddess Diana, you would go to their temple and they have, pre let's set it up like that. Okay, the church does not come from that. It doesn't come from us trying to copy religion. It doesn't come from man-made structure. 
The church is derived, I hope you're seeing this, we're spending a lot of time on it, it derives out of the nature of God. And we looked at, as we did several weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, that it actually, you see this idea of this kind of this gathering that God wants his people to gather, to come together. We see that in the Old Testament as well as the New. It's not just a New Testament idea, right? This, this, this idea of church is, is, comes out of, and, and so that's one of the points that if it's in the Old Testament too, we have to recognize that this is connected to who God is more than who we are. Right? It derives its nature from God. And then we see, so within the Trinity, God's outpouring love, and I want to stress that. Um, I made sure I used the back end. Just I've done that before in class. Uh, at NBC, I drew on this, and I was like, what did I just do? Anyway, so outpouring love, okay, outpouring love. And that's important. We'll talk about that in a moment, okay? I want you to see that picture in your head that when it comes to God, His love always goes out, okay? So picture that in your head. That outpouring love idea is important. It doesn't go out and then back in, okay? God's outpouring love doesn't do this either. It doesn't mostly go out and some come back in, okay? So God's outpouring love isn't self-love too, okay? We'll talk about that. So his love is outpouring to the other members within the Trinity, A, outside of himself to his children, B, and then two, to the whole world. And now I'm saying one to A, B, and C don't necessarily, like, does God love the church more than he loves the world, those that aren't saved? I, I don't, I know that those that are saved, Israel has a special place in God's heart. Does that mean that God loves Jews more than he loves Gentiles? I, I don't think we can say that. We know that God has a special place, what the Bible says, for the Jews in his heart. I think God has a special place for his children, those that believe in Jesus Christ in his heart. But who did God send Jesus, his only son, to die on the cross for? The world. For God so loved the world. God loved the world. So, so I'm not trying to make... Um, I'm not trying to like subordinate these under each other. We just recognize, and I, I, I recognize that there's probably a stronger love, a stronger unity with Jesus Christ and the Father than, than with me, or than like there is probably something like that. But I mean, the Bible doesn't clearly define that. I'm sure theology, theologians have, but I would argue to say exactly what that looks like. I don't know. I don't necessarily need to talk about. I don't. That's not the point this morning. But that's kind of our, our focus. And then, so then as the church, the uh, people of God, as God is pouring into us his outpouring love, then we also love God, we love each other, and then we love the lost world around us, right? See the connection there. So as we are called to these things in Scripture, as the body of Christ, as believers, as disciples of Jesus, as as the church, as the family of God, we recognize that it comes from who God is. There's a connection there. That's what I'm trying to really uh, show, that there's a connection, that the world sees God through us, but then also recognize that, and I didn't do a second one, and I should have maybe in a different color, that like God's outpouring love is, comes to us as well. Okay, enough said. I don't want to spend too much time on that, but... <coughs> So the church is the godly, instinctively gathering of God's family. So we're God-focused. We're godly. We're focused on Him. And then we are instinctively gathering. There's something within us, and that's the Spirit of God. Because we're connected to who God is, that we have this instinctive nature to gather. And also we're called to it in, 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 in the Word. So gathering of God's family, gathering God's children. And in so... We, by God's design, are to reflect God to the world. That God is real. He is, and, and this is who God is. You want to know the one divine God? You look at his church. That's how the world gets a better picture of who God is. And then two, we are, we are to reflect his nature. So specifically, his love and righteousness. The church is called to live out with God 
his purposes and mission to save the lost and mature the saved. And we do that through reflecting God. We do that through relationship with him, connection with him. And then also, as he pours out his love and righteousness on us, and as we grow in that and understand that, we pour out that love and righteousness to others, right? We communicate it to others. We become kind of this, this in-between, like a priest, right? We'll talk about that um, in, in the future. So 2 Corinthians 5.20 says this, We are therefore, and Paul is speaking to the church of Corinth, but he's saying we, so he's not just saying you are, he's saying we are as church. Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So we're a part of that. How we understand our, our, our triune God, seeing the connection between God and the church, um, it becomes very important. So how we understand God becomes important, but then seeing that connection to church becomes important for us as well. And it becomes important because we're the church. I was doing some reading this week, and one of the authors I was reading it was saying that when it comes to like different theologies, so like our theology of the Trinity, the, the church has spent a lot of time working on that. I think we've even gone beyond what some of the scripture says about that and kind of come up with our system of what is. Um, uh, some of the stuff in terms of um, Christ's divinity, we've, the church has spent a, a fair bit of time working that through and being like, okay, this is what the church believes. This is what we believe. This is what the Bible teaches. Um, most of the theologies the church has spent a fair bit of time with except for the theology of the church. And we're starting to see, uh, even in, and this is uh, written about uh, maybe about 15, 20 years ago now, but we're starting to see that there, has, there, there is a miss, or there is um, obviously a, a, this, this lack in the church of a real good understanding of what is church. And we see that by all the different denominations, all the different divisions within the church and how people view church, and how people think of church, right? Because how you think of church plays out in what you do. It plays out in how you, how you engage church. And so we recognize that as the church, it becomes very important, number one, to understand the triune God, but then also to understand the church and how those two are connected. And when we realize um, that there's this really strong connection, then it becomes very important for us as church so, um, okay, yeah, we'll do this. No, it's okay. Okay, so then it becomes very important for us as church, because we're here, right, to understand what? Well, to understand what does God mean when he says love? What does God mean when he says righteousness, right? And I think most of us, for the most part, will go, well, I understand that. We've heard in the church about God's love and loving. We've heard about that tons. And we know about righteousness. Sure, we know about that. But I, I want to say, though, but if we understand now that church then derives its nature from God, and yet if we look at the church in our day, and we recognize, we recognize, so here, anyone here would agree or would disagree with me that we see within the Trinity that unity is like one of its core functions, one of its core values, one of its core things, whether it's in his persons or his being, we won't get into that, but, but unity is obviously clearly important to the Trinity. Anyone disagree with me? And maybe you want to, but if you look at the Trinity, the fact that we believe that our God is three in one, and that they are, they are, there is unity there, and that even Jesus prays about unity, then you look at our church today Right? Do you see the disconnect? To be like, okay, then if you see if our God is unity, but yet we live in profound disunity, right? Then there is something, as a church, as the church specifically, right? Like specifically as the church, because as Christians, or if we said believers in Jesus, I think we would probably have a bigger group. We'd be like, well, the, sure. But if we're like, how about your church? And as we talk about church, well, there's division all over the place, right? And so then, if unity is one of these chief things of the God that we serve, then as church, why is there so much disunity? So there's something wrong then. Is it that we don't understand unity? Is that the word that we have to maybe take some time to, 
to theologize and be like, well, God's in unity and so are we, but unity actually means disunity and it means that we don't have to hang, about, uh, you know, hang out with each other and it means that we can continue to, to break off and have church split and church split and church split and, and change this and move here and change in here and not talk to them because they're not really and they're not really and that's what unity means. I think most of us would be like, no, I think we understand unity. But maybe we've come so familiar with the word love. Maybe we've come so familiar with righteousness that maybe if this unity is chiefly rooted in love and righteousness, maybe we understand what unity is. And we understand in the church what disunity is. We understand what disunity is in our relationships. We understand what disunity is in our families. We understand what disunity is. And I think, I would argue that, it, you know, one of our troubles is that we don't actually understand love and righteousness as God understands love and righteousness. So let's jump into 1 John 4, 7 and 9. So 1 John 7 says, or sorry, 7 to 8. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Listen, I'm going to say that again. Listen to that. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Now, if we take that verse at face value, what does it sound like John is saying? It sounds like John is arguing for universalism, which is this idea that, that everyone's going to be saved. Listen, listen to what he says. <coughs> oh, I'm on the wrong verse. I scrolled down already too fast. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. So do you know people that aren't a part of the church that still love, that you would say, yeah, they love their kids? Oh, they fell in love with their wife when they were young. Oh, they love their grandkids. Oh, man, that guy loves his car. Well, if these people love, then surely they know God. And if they know God, we know from Scripture that if they know God, that means they know, how do you get to know God? How do you know God? Through Jesus Christ. So, so, so if these people love, then therefore they must be going to heaven. They must be saved, right? That's what he's saying? That's not what he's saying. So he must be saved. But that is literally what he says here. I'm not, I don't have to go into the Greek to this. He says, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. How many people do you know in the world that just absolutely don't love anyone? How we define love. Well, there's actually, there's not that many. So then there must be something different between what John here is calling love and what we understand as love, right? Either that or the Bible is in profound contradiction of itself. It's in profound contradiction of itself because we know that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, uh, 6 and 7, sorry. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That means you don't get to know the Father unless you go through Jesus Christ. If you really know me, Jesus says, so it's, it's talking about knowing here, if you really know me, you will know my Father as well. So there's a connection. When you get to know Jesus Christ, you get to know the Father. From now on, he says to his disciples, you do know him and you have seen him. Right? I mean, I don't think I need to share with you guys the so many verses that say that, that we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone. You guys know that. I won't even go over that, but we know that. In order to know God we need to know Jesus Christ, and it comes by faith in Jesus Christ. So then what is John saying back in verse 7 and 8? 
In order for us to know God, even, even Jesus says, I'm going to say this one even point, in order for us to know God, we must have faith in Jesus Christ and trust him. Also, we know that if we don't know God, what happens? What does Jesus say happens to those who go to him and say, Lord, Lord, we did this and we did that for you. And Jesus goes, away from me, I never knew you. And partially, they did a bunch of good things in Jesus' name, but they are sent into hell because they didn't know Jesus. And because they didn't know Jesus, they didn't actually know the will of the Father. And that's in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, we see that. So then knowing God becomes something that we do through Jesus Christ. So when John writes, whoever loves knows God, and whoever does not love does not know God, he is not saying that if you love, then you must know God, and then you must be saved. That somehow Jesus, when he dies on the cross, he pays for all your sin, and you don't have to worry about it. And as long as you love your grandkids, or you love your kids, or you love your girlfriend, or you love your car, you love, as long as you love, well, then you must know God. That's not what he's saying. So then the, the, the conclusion then must be, either the Bible is very in con contradiction here, or that our definition of love is different than God's definition of love. So what man calls love is not what John is speaking of here. John is speaking of what God calls love. And if you love with, and we're going to call it for today, God love. If you love with God love, then you know God. And if you don't love with God love, you don't, know, you don't know God. And this type of love, this true love, this God love is from God alone. And God calls it love. So those who don't God love others don't know God. And you can human love others, or maybe better said, you can fall in love others. But that does not mean you know God. So then what's the difference between God love and the love that we think of, the human love or fallen love? We are made in God's image, so we have the capacity to love. But our love as humans is tainted by sin and self, right? We are sinners. All of what we are is tainted by sin and self. So when God says love, when God's talking about love, he's talking about pure love. Love that is tainted by sin, it still can be love but it's tainted by sin. To God is not true love. Remember, God's love or God love is always pouring out to other. It does not love self. This is what John is saying. You can't really love or God love. You cannot really love unless you know God. Because your love has not been purified through Christ. Your love has not been, been uh, redeemed outside of Jesus Christ. So your love is still love because you're made in the image of God, but and it, it, it pours out, but it also comes in, right? There's also some self in there. So we love, but there's also self, right? I mean, uh, and we've talked about it a little bit, right? Like um, when we're... When we're um, when we're dating, let's say, pure love would be also what? Completely honest, right? God's love is always honest. But when you're dating, do you just... Think about when you're dating. Were you completely honest with the other person about who you really were? Or were you just like a little extra polite? A little extra intentional to, to kind of hide the, the real you? Right? 
Maybe you, you, went, you went a little bit more out of your way to be, to look a little shinier. Would true love do that? Now, did you love? I'm assuming at some point you started to love your wife. You started to love your husband. At that point, your girlfriend or your boyfriend, there was love there, but there was also a little bit of self there. Why? Because you weren't just outrightly honest and be like, Here, here's me and all my flaws, right? So you're going to have to choose to love me, even with all my flaws. We kind of keep those flaws a little hidden for a while, hopefully until they are at least willing to say, I'll, I'll, I'll get married to you, at least until the engagement, right? And then hopefully they don't, and the truth is most, most people don't really get to know the person they married if we're really honest, and, and you have to be honest with yourself in terms of not just like, yeah, I, I feel like I did maybe marry someone a little different than the person I was dating. Okay, yeah, too, but be honest with yourself that you were kind of a little different. You were on your, let's say, just, let's just say best behavior, right, when you were dating. So there's a little self there in that love. See, God's love is absent of that love. God's love is always pouring out. It doesn't come back for self. The word here uh, that, that, that uh, John uses is gnosko in terms of that knowing of God. It's from a prime verb, to know. It's something that you do, so you know or you're knowing. But it's not just connected to knowledge in your mind, but it's also connected to of, of kind of like being aware of or a feeling or having. Okay? So it's understanding, but also uh, something that you kind of, you feel and you have. So it's a knowing of head. It's a knowing of heart. It's a knowing of having. The one who does not know God, head, heart, have. Right? Does not love. The one that does not have God does not love with this kind of God love. And that's because human love is fallen love. It, there is self mixed in with it. Church, our, our love, if we know God and are walking with him, will be an outpouring love to others and an out outpouring love to God as well. And be absent of self-seeking motivations, self-seeking desires, really absent of selfishness and sin and pride. And it will be pursuing the purposes in the glory of God. We as the church have to be careful not to fall into syncretism where we mix kind of the love of what we understand God's love to be, right? We'll be like, when we're reading it, we, we have to recognize what God means by that rather than as humans, and I mean, we li who live on this earth, this is earth, to taking kind of our, our definition of love and our understanding of love and kind of just mixing them, Right? I mean, syncretism is one of, it's, it's a kind of a big word, but um, um, so missionaries are trained to guard against synchronism, syncretism. And it's basically when you're uh, on a mission field, you want to go and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people, but you don't want them to accept it and then just to add it to all their other beliefs. That's syncretism, okay? And then where they, where they conflict each other, it's just like, oh, well, it's okay. It doesn't matter. So, like, let's say if you're a, a Christian and you're going to go share the gospel of Jesus Christ with um, someone who's Hindu, right? And the Hindus have, I mean, it's, it's debatable, but the, the, the Hindus have uh, th three, 33 million gods, it's said, okay? So, so there's a lot of gods. And you can, most Hindus worship, you know, they, they, they pick four or five and kind of have one key one that they worship and they have four or five other ones that they kind of embrace, and so if, they, if you came to them and said, you need to believe in Jesus Christ for your salvation so that you go to heaven, they'd be like, hey, yeah, you know what? And I've talked about this before, right? They would just be like, yeah, you know what? Awesome. I, I like that. And, and then I'm going to bring my, you know, because I still worship Shiva and, and these other gods. So now, why can't I just bring them together? And now I'll worship them both. And then you say, yeah, I'm sorry, but Jesus says I'm the only way and that these are actually not gods. And they're like, you know what? But that's okay. 
I'm going to just kind of bring these together and kind of figure out a system where I can love Jesus and worship him and love these other gods, and it's okay. That's syncretism, right? The Bible, the Bible is not syncretistic by nature. It doesn't allow for that. And so we need to be make, making sure because we do the same thing where we kind of understand, we, we kind of see this, the Bible teach about this love that's incredible. And we're like, yeah, no, that's good because I have love and I love too. And we kind of just bring this all together and we're like, we're good. But then the, out, but why aren't we good? Right? Church unity, love. Church in the world, division. I don't know if that's spelled right. It's not T, is it? It's SS. Yeah. Something like that. Right? So the problem with us doing that is that we actually don't live in the unity because we don't actually have the love. It makes sense why, if we love with fallen love, why there would be division, right? Even in the church, right? Because I love, sure, but I also love me a little bit too. So then when you're loving, Jason, do the same thing to me. Go like this, okay? So you're loving me, and you do, but then if you have some selfishness there, there's a point where our love here and our love for self is going to come in conflict. Because if Jason's like, you know what, though, but I want this. And I'm like, yeah, but you know what? I love you, but I want this. In the end, what's going to win? Either I'm going to choose to die to self and not love myself, or I'm going to go, you know what? I still love him, but I'm doing this. And he's going to say, yes, I still love Adam, sure, but I'm doing this. And then there's division. So it makes sense that if we don't understand God's love and we're not pushing towards it, then there's going to be division. The, the result isn't going to be unity like there should be, like there is in the Trinity. That's what Jesus prayed for, right? We, we looked at that already. Jesus prayed that we would have love like, like there is our unity, like Jesus and the Father had unity within the Trinity, that there would be unity. So obviously... This matters. We see a problem here. We see a problem here. We see that maybe there is a little bit of fallen love in our understanding of love. So first and foremost, we have to recognize that this love comes from God. This love comes from God. It's not a man-made love. This love comes from God. Verse 7 says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. He's not talking about fallen love. He's talking about God love. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. I'll ask you this question, though, in closing. When you recognize those those, the difference between God's love, which is absolutely pure and absent of self and self-love, and human love, which is love, but it's tainted with self. Church, is your love growing to be more and more like God love? Or does it still look a little like the world's love or fallen love? Are you growing in God love? Through Christ, by faith in him, it is from God. It is from God, absent of self. Let's pray. Lord God in heaven, I thank you for our time together. Um, lots to share that connects back to this, that makes this maybe even clearer, but uh, we will save that for next time. We thank you for your word, Lord God. We thank you for your word. God, I pray that you would fill us with God's love. That you would fill us with God's love. That you would help us to understand how important it is that we as the church understand who you are and understand our word. Understand the word of God that you've given us. 
God, may our love, may, 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 whenever we see our love being tainted with self, where there's love, but there's still like, but no, I don't want it. I don't, you know, me. God, I just pray that you would uh, convict our heart and God, that we would just turn to you in repentance. And uh, Lord God, that, uh, that we know that when we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us. And then Lord God, just wash us head to toe with your love. That we might love each other because love is from God and we are your children. Help us do that, Lord, more and more. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen.